So today's webinar is on government information for social workers from students to professionals. And uh, we are present here with uh, Michelle Donlin, who is the scholarly communications and research librarian and subject liaison for social work at East Stroudsburg University in East Stroudsburg, Pennsylvania. She also serves as Kemp Library Depository Coordinator and holds an MLIS with a concentration in e-government librarianship from the University of Maryland. So thank you very much, Michelle. Thank you. Thank you so much for uh, letting me present today. So I'm going to talk to you today about government information for social workers. Just to put this a little bit in context, um, as a liaison and also as kind of the government information librarian here at ESU, um, it's really an interesting blend because social work has so much government information within it. Um, learning a little bit more about the users of the library and um, uh, how they can actually connect to that information really benefits their research, I think, in the long run. So let's move forward. We're going to talk about uh, today's goals, webinar goals. Uh, first, I want to talk a little bit about information literacy and government information literacy. Uh, next, we'll talk about social work library users. So we'll identify some user groups and then explore some of their unique information needs. Uh, then we'll move on to strategies for social work liaisons. So things you can actually do as a liaison in social work uh, to kind of connect your user groups to government information. And then finally, we'll talk a little bit about social work online research guides and some examples of what you can um, do on your guides and also uh, some websites to include. So first up, I have uh, this word cloud uh, from ACRL's Framework of Information Literacy for Higher Ed uh, and their literacy definition. So it really shows you information is kind of at that uh, center forefront about what is literacy is about anyway. Uh, as we know, it's as they define it, it's a set of integrated abilities encompassing reflective discovery of information. So you find the information, then you understand the information that was produced um, and the value for it, and then you use that information to produce your own research. There are some literacy resources uh, that ALA and ACRL have that are available online. One is the ALA Literacy Clearinghouse, which I've linked for you, and also the Framework of Information Literacy uh, for Higher Ed. I think um, a lot of us are probably familiar with some of these concepts, um, so I'm not going to go too far into it, but I wanted to show you the types of literacies that ALA mentions. Uh, this graphic shows you all the different types of literacies that they sort of talk about in that clearinghouse. Clear, you know, information literacy in general, and then different smaller literacies, digital literacy, health literacy. Uh, the closest to government information literacy um, that's mentioned, currently mentioned, is political literacy. So the idea of understanding your political environment and using that information um, effectively as a citizen. So it's interesting that government information, it's close, it's a, it's a cousin to that, but it's not defined here. My definition of government information literacy, I'm just applying a simple information literacy definition, the ability to find, understand, and use government information. We can make it much more complex than that. A lot of the literature that's out there, it's interesting because it sort of dances around the concept of of government information literacy. We talk a lot about collections as government documents librarians. Uh, we talk a lot about how we apply that to um, courses, how we might teach government documents or government information. Uh, but there, there's not a ton out there, um, especially regarding government information literacy, having that definition, and then relating it to a topic like social work. There's more and more um, literature that's been out recently, but you know, more to come, uh, definitely an area where we can develop in. Uh, this quote I found perfect is that students simply lack government information literacy skills needed to develop the best strategies of using that information. Uh, as, an in, as a librarian, I, I definitely can attest to that within my courses. So if you're a new liaison, you can learn more about social work and social workers and their needs. Uh, at these two websites. One, the National Association of Social Workers. So this is their professional association. You know, the, what we 
use ALA for, this is what they would use. Uh, they do have resources in their career center for students. So kind of stepping through and becoming a social worker, if you're interested in social work, more information about it there. Also, there is the Council of Social Work Education. Now this is the US credit, accreditation board, basically. Uh, the standard, the group that um, uh, is really focused on social work education. It's interesting to see both what they say as a group focused on ed educator, the education process, um, educating undergrads and graduate students and so forth, versus you know, NSAW, which is the professional association, which they graduated um, the types of services uh, available, professional development services available to them. So government information, I found, is inherently embedded in social work. Uh, so I found this great um, uh, figure in uh, an article by uh, Trevithix, and I know I'm going to get that, that name wrong, um, but they talked about different types of knowledge within social work. And one of those types of knowledge is factual knowledge. And it's interesting, if you look at social work compared to other areas, that really government information is everywhere within here. It's just embedded within each area of the of factual knowledge. Some social work jargon uh, for especially newer liaisons, evidence-based practice. Now, you might have heard this in other areas, in health, in, in medicine. Um, Evidence-based practice, or EBP, really addresses that gap between research and practice. Uh, in evidence-based practice, you basically look at, for high-quality uh, resources that will help you provide interventions um, and will help guide the process to come up with treatments and services for your client. Uh, there is this inherent component of information literacy within the evidence-based practice uh, process itself. Uh, Social Work Policy Institute has some interesting links on this. It is a little bit older, this website, so um, some of the stuff you'd have to, uh, some links work and some you have to Google, but it is an interesting um, resource to look at. Why should we as librarians uh, know about evidence-based practice or even care about it. Uh, Drisco wrote this article about six steps within evidence-based process decision-making. Um, and what this is, is it helps the, the practitioner or the social worker um, step through the whole evidence-based process. So once our students graduate, they should understand this process and hopefully they would um, be able to embody it out in the world while they're, while they're working and, and serve their client. So first they would identify an issue or a problem that their client's having. Then they find the best available research knowledge, so the most high quality research you can find on that topic. Third step would be critically reviewing the quality of that research um, and compare it to your client's needs. Four, work with the client collaboratively, um, discuss that research. Five, finalize the treatment plan based on the research. And then six, implement and evaluate that plan. So step two and three are just spot on for information literacy. And Dris Drisco even says that it requires the skills of a reference librarian to perform step two. And if you don't, if you're not a reference librarian, you need to reach out to one. And of course, three is about source evaluation. So evidence-based practice is a great in and a great way to kind of connect with faculty and students and say, hey, this is why we as librarians are relevant, and guess what information you probably are going to use? Government information. So that's kind of an intro of uh, government literacy, information literacy, a little bit background of social work, um, jargon, and knowledge. Then you want to think of, OK, how do we determine our library's social work user groups? Who from social work would be using our library? It really depends, I think, on the size of your library, what programs you have, and um, probably the location as well, uh, of depending on what populations are using your library. So in order to figure that out, you can look through your statistics. You can go through your reference or research assistance questions, see if you record 
um, the user's user type um, to determine if you are assisting a social work students. Um, statistics collected at other desks. Some libraries have a separate government documents area. Some folks have separate reference and circulation desks. Some have the one combined. So it's kind of a, accumulating all those different stats and, and to see that picture. And then, of course, you can look at the circulation stats of your actual physical materials um, within the social sciences and see what popular topics are actually being checked out. You can conduct a survey. We participate at ESU in LibQual. So um, when the years come up for LibQual, we have our survey. We try to get as many folks involved. And we ask them to put what their discipline is. So you can narrow your search results, your survey results, to um, folks within the discipline to see if, what they're using and how they're using it. You can talk to people. So this is going to be a major theme that I found out as a little liaison is actually reaching out to different um, groups on campus to help you identify those social work user groups. So you can have a focus group. You can reach out to your student organization. You can reach out to related student service departments on campus. Uh, if you have a library advisory group, uh, that is awesome. You can use that. Some folks have just a smaller library advisory group as we, we have here at ESU, and then other folks might have larger groups, like a separate student um, library advisory group. And that can really help um, contribute to ideas um, and moving things forward within the library. And then finally, talk to your community organizations. Who is hiring the students once they graduate uh, from campus? So if anyone's local, uh, where might they get a job? And reaching out to them and seeing, OK, what information needs, government information needs, uh, do your incoming employees uh, should have? What should they have? What skills should they have at that point? Some areas of library users I've identified clearly are students. Um, we have undergraduates and graduates. Uh, we're unique at ESU. I'll tell you a little bit more about um, our program um, in a minute. And then we have our faculty and staff. And then we occasionally have social work practitioners. This is an interesting group because these are the folks who might have graduated, um, stayed in the area, and might come back to utilize the space for uh, studying for exams, especially for their certifications or licensure. Or they could use the library as a space to meet their clients. They have all different types of needs. Some of them overlap, and then some of them are, are specialized. So let's look at our information needs for the social work faculty and staff. I think the main one that jumps out of me is library instruction. Uh, you, you reach out as a liaison to your departments and ask them if they need anything. A lot of times, you might get some silence from certain departments, and other ones might respond more actively. I've found in, in the two different positions I've worked at as a social work liaison um, librarian that social work is very engaging. They are happy and thrilled to work with you, um, and they will jump at that chance. So I usually always get responses from social work, uh, where in other areas they're not as eager to use it. Develop information literacy skills through assignments and activities. One thing we'll get in our library are students that come around with these assignments that the faculty have not told us about um, that need additional um, help to fulfill them. And so it's a way that we can connect with the faculty members. And the students talk about the assignments, talk about the skills. A lot of times this is one-on-one. -on -one. We try to pitch library instruction at that point. Um, sometimes we're successful and sometimes we're not. Another reason they'll talk to us is troubleshooting help. So say databases aren't working. Um, there is an issue that they're having as a researcher or their student is, is experiencing and reporting to them. And then finally, sometimes they do consult us for their own research. I know a lot of times um, faculty, as well as other librarians, we think that we know everything under the sun and uh, we don't need other support. But really, it is nice to talk out uh, your research topic with uh, a librarian and uh, get additional feedback. You might get ideas you didn't know before. So our information needs for social work undergraduate students, a lot of undergrad programs are focused on the generalist, so generalist education, so that the student 
once graduated, they have skills to work in various parts of the social work field, uh, that they, they would be ready to enter in, um, in any, whether it's with an agency, whether it's with the government, um, you know, within prisons, you know, whatever their skill set might be. Um, introduction to evidence-based practice. So we talked a little bit before about evidence-based practice, why it's important, and how um, information literacy fits within it. Uh, as an undergrad, you're kind of, I know early undergrads, you're kind of, we give you baby steps into <laughs> um, information literacy. We don't know where uh, the student's particular background is coming from. Um, so we need to give them the refreshers or, or teach them the basic skills. And then as they advance into upper level courses, they'll learn more about evidence-based practices and have more specific assignments um, dealing with that. Uh, so we'll move from that reliable resources to evidence-based and then empir and empirical research. There are specific standards for social work programs. Um, we're going to go a little bit more into that in a moment, uh, but we want to keep that in mind that uh, social work programs need to be, or would hopefully be accredited. So uh, we need to meet those standards within it for, the, for our programs. For graduate students, clearly when they come in, we like to do a basic, um, uh, kind of basic skills of information literacy, what we hope they have established at that point, and then it rapidly goes more complex. And they're going to need more um, in-depth research on one specific topic. And of course, we can look more at their standards. Uh, this is a photograph of some of our social work graduate students. At ESU, we have a program that actually is run through Marywood University, located in Scranton, Pennsylvania. And we are one of their um, uh, kind of branch campuses, satellite campuses. Uh, so the students can come here. While they're Marywood students, they can um, use our campus. They can use our library um, as a space. So a lot of folks who graduate from ESU with their bachelors can then stay within the area and attend Marywood at ESU. Information needs of early career and entry level social workers. So this is where you can look for your professional association at the highest level and then locally, regionally, and see um, what uh, information is available there and their specific needs. We can look at job postings as well and see what are the requirements of these job postings. Um, are there any standards? Is there a level that they need to be familiar with? So if part of their um, the job that they're applying for deals with uh, um, writing plans and implementing policies, you know, are they familiar with that? Also look at state, county, and local training requirements. So for my example here is charting the course. In Philadelphia, um, I know the community umbrella agencies, the CUAs, uh, everyone takes charting the course um, for case managers coming in. So knowing that this program is uh, run through Pitt, and it's pretty intense curriculum. As you see here, it's 120 hours of in-classroom work six hours of online work. So this is a type of module where if your school is located near an employer that would require you to take this course, it would make sense to integrate and tell your students about this before they graduate. So maybe linking on um, the library's website or uh, just mentioning it um, or connecting with your uh, career services on campus so that anyone who comes to them is familiar with it. I'm going to click on it. and So here, it's pretty intense. So if I was going to graduate and go into the child welfare system in Pennsylvania, I can click on here and it tells me about the module, how long it would take to complete it. So you would go to a one day, you'd go to the, a workshop on this, and you can see all the different handouts and something that's uh, interesting is that they have their references and summary of laws and bulletins and regulations. So you can really uh, um, change and adapt 
uh, your, say, online research guide to include uh, some of these items. So if you know that they're going to be looking at some of these laws, having those laws accessible so the students can uh, be aware of it and be prepared that they're going to have this intense training, um, potentially if they get hired by that institution. Okay. Information needs for certified and licensed professionals. So we're stepping up again. We're talking about the folks who probably graduated, they have their master's degrees, and they're looking to be certified or licensed um, within their state. Uh, so there are exams that you would take, the Association of Social Work Boards. And it's interesting because just like the rest of social work, um, government information is embedded within them. It's not explicit. It's not separated out. It's just a part of it. Uh, there is social work license, licensing guide, if I can say that correctly, um, here. So how to become a licensed social worker and the different types. So it's, it's easy to understand. It's straightforward. Uh, whether you have, uh, which degree you have. Um, and something that's also interesting, uh, it links back to the ASWB that we, that we're, that's on our presentation. And it has different requirements by state. So if I click on Pennsylvania, it's going to talk about Pennsylvania social work licensing requirements. Um, gives us the schools where you can attend if you're interested, um, and then talks a little bit about it. So you can look up your state there. Okay. Yep. Let's go back one more. Um, and also, they have the licensing boards and college websites under ASWB. So I can click here, and I can go and select Pennsylvania, generate report, and I can see this is my licensure board at the state level. Here are the statutes, and here are the rules in the PA code relating to that. So I find this very helpful. If someone was coming in and was interested in this information, we, you just look up your state, and then you can see the requirements by your state. We're going to switch gears a little bit now and talk about some of the strategies for social work liaisons. So if you're a new liaison or you're just trying to reconnect with the department, maybe it's been a while, um, here are my seven strategies of, of sort of what I've worked through um, a little bit at this point, and I'm going to go into each of them in depth. The first strategy is trying to get social work department buy-in. Sometimes this can be hard. Um, for certain departments. You know, social work has usually been very friendly and outgoing, and they definitely tell you what they need, and they're, and they're very grateful for uh, any help they do get. My advice is to try to befriend and get in with either the dean, the faculty chair, or the administrative assistant. Anyone who's willing to talk to you and willing to uh, uh, chat about the information that you want to talk about, you know, it goes, it goes miles. Talk to, see if there's any department committees. So within our social work department, they actually have committees within the faculty. So they can focus on different tasks, whether it's reaccreditation, whether it's a library committee, so that only two people are, are talking to me rather than me sending every message to every faculty member within the department. Especially keep an eye out on enthusiastic faculty, so the ones who do respond, try to find some, um, especially the new folks too, newbies like myself who are tenure track faculty, uh, who are always looking to uh, gain new contacts. My second strategy, ask them for social work curriculum documents. So it's easier to get syllabi and assignments when you're teaching, uh, when you're scheduled to teach information literacy for a class. However, there are other things like course proposals uh, for you. you can refer to your curriculum committees uh, or reaccreditation reports. So this past year, our social work department uh, and I worked together on the CSWE reaccreditation report, and it's this actual librarian's report is one component of the whole thing. Uh, so we went through everything that the report needed, wrote it, and they were fabulous because they gave me several months in advance. 
another department, um, I've had other department experiences where they give you like a day's notice for that information. So it's great to have the time to, to put into a good report. Also ask them for internal documents. Do they have annual reports or assessment reports? I know we have an, a university assessment committee, so uh, they will submit assessment reports to that committee. And within those documents, you can see where is the, that need and usage of government information. So analyze what you have, identify those government information literacies, and the potential user groups. You want to compare any known student um, learning outcomes, so those assessment reports, right, uh, to uh, information literacy. Where can you where can you kind of find your way in? So here is an example from a social work syllabi also listed these competencies. Now these competencies align with the uh, CSWA, um, the reaccreditation um, competencies. Uh, so it, when it comes time for them to up get reaccredited, they can, you know, sort of copy and paste. They're already doing um, what's required of them. And as you see here from this competency five, you know, it even says mediated by policy and implementation at the federal, state, and local levels. So social workers understand the history and current structures of social policies and services. So There's clear um, connection to government information, and it's a way that you can talk the professors or whoever will buy in to the idea um, that it is necessary to incorporate uh, government information literacy within either information literacy sessions or uh, other resources you can create. So you found something that's related. What do you do next? Communicate those findings. Tell the social work department. Let them know that you found something. Tell your colleagues. Far too often librarians um, do a lot of work in smaller silos, and they don't communicate all the different projects they're working on. You really have to prioritize that. But if you have a moment, whether it's in a meeting, um, to share your ideas or an e a quick email, or even do a training. So maybe you might do a training with your colleagues on one of the websites that I'm going to feature um, shortly, then you can explain to them how it's connected to the social work curriculum. Also, tell the, you know, the administration, whether it's your library administrators or the university administrators. You'll, you usually submit annual reports, um, and they have to be connected a lot of times to the larger university strategic plan. So on the left here is our students first is the current strategic plan that we're under. And if I can connect anything to the goal one of student success, you know, I will. So if through what we do um, and uh, incorporating more government information literacy, if that helps the students succeed and make them better prepared and helps them graduate, then that's something that you really want to advertise to your uh, administrators. Strategy five, you implement changes. So a lot of this focuses on instruction. It's what can you do as a lia liaison. So you can pitch the idea of government information um, during, while you're planning um, your library instruction sessions. Uh, sometimes faculty might turn that down, and other times if you're able to pick it out from their own syllabi, uh, it makes sense and they'll let you run with it a bit. You can prepare an elevator speech. I've heard about this a lot and sometimes don't give too much credit to it, uh, but it really is something that I think librarians need to perfect. Because if I have that two minutes with my uh, university president, you know, I, I'd like to have that prepared. Uh, a good resource for that is the Value of Academic Library Statement. So this statement through ACRL, but it has some good um, examples of what you could adapt to government information literacy within it. And as always, if you're short on time, you can promote online research guides with the government information links. So sometimes the faculty members will say, no, sorry, we don't have a chance to do instruction. Spring semester here is tough because we have a lot of uh, snow days and late starts in Pennsylvania. So we see less instruction in the spring because of that. And um, if the professor 
isn't able to give us a short, shortened period of time for instruction, then we can always add that to our research guides. Strategy number six, communicate changes. Again, we're communicating. It's super important as a liaison. You want to talk to the social work department. You want to talk to your other librarians, to the administration. We've, we've discussed that already. But there's other folks you can talk to, career services on campus. So at ESU, we have Career Development Center. So the idea of liaisoning with them and saying, OK, what resources are you giving social work folks who are coming to you? And how can we fit within that process? Uh, how can we better prepare our folks for that career? Potential, um, potential employers. So are they referring to um, local agencies? Are they referring to uh, the, feder the federal or state government? Where are they referring those folks to? And then can we talk to them? Is there a program like what we saw in the charting the course example? Um, where if we know the potential of our students graduating and going uh, there, then we can prepare the better prepare them with that government information literacy knowledge. And then finally, try to communicate this stuff to the students <laughs> whenever you have that opportunity to, whether it's in classes, it's at the reference desk, or uh, if you go visit any of their organizations or uh, their organizational events that they hold. And finally, let's close that loop. As a liaison, you want to assess and you want to analyze your own work. Uh, so what results did you find out? Uh, what were the limitations that you were or weren't able to do? Did it produce anything that you can share? And how can you expand it and improve upon that? Um, not everything will work, and that's OK. Uh, but document what you have, uh, come up with suggestions, and there's always next semester to work on something um, different and tweak it a little bit. So for me, the ultimate liaison challenge is how can we best support student success? Remember, it sounds like the um, uh, our strategic plan from earlier. As a liaison, what is my role within it? Well, first, I like to understand and have a sense, a better sense of who am I helping? What are their needs? And we've reviewed um, that so far. And then once you understand it, what can I do about it? So it's building those collaborations. It's how can it inform my instruction and also my online research guides. So I'm going to take a quick cat break and pause and see if anyone has any questions or comments or anything they'd like to share with us. So we're going to move on to social work online research guides. Yay. So I know we all <laughs> maintain them. Um, and we all see the quirks for them. Uh, a lot of times, I will just refer to libguides or libguides, however you prefer to say them. I usually say libguides uh, as the online research guide platform. I know other libraries use other types of guides or might just use a, a different uh, website, and that's OK. Uh, the benefits of using online research guides, as you probably know on a daily basis if you do use them. Uh, supposedly, they can, be, they can be easy to create or add content. You can kind of throw something on there pretty quickly once you understand how to use the system. Um, accessibility of government information, I think that's uh, really a key here of um, creating guides with the most relevant information for that user group. So if we're talking about a social work guide, uh, what are the information needs they're using within their assignments. How can I link those websites? And, and we're going to go over a few of them soon. Challenges. Effective design is always a challenge, I find, for research guides. Everyone has their own style and method of how they want to do things. I definitely recommend getting together as a group and trying to come up with one cohesive um, template for the library to use so that the guides look um, a bit better. Maintenance workload. That's always tough because, yes, you can throw a link on a guide. Um, yes, they do have like dead link checkers that you could see which ones have died. But it does take a lot of energy to make it look good, to add things to it, to make it very effective. And it's not something that you can just put up there and walk away for years and years. It's something that will 
that's fluid and that, is, that changes from time to time from semester to semester, and hopefully it builds. So you can add new content informed by the not documentation, um, the information you might have found or the stuff that you developed as a liaison. Uh, and there are different types of guides. So there are these really comprehensive general guides that kind of cover every topic. I like to call them the kitchen sink. It's everything but the kitchen sink, right? Um, and then you have these smaller, uh, well, different guides of various subjects or topics. So maybe just on social media, maybe just on a smaller topic. Um, and I'm going to show you an example in just a moment. Um, and they can be informed by job placement. So as I mentioned, charting the course, um, seeing what uh, they might need in child welfare, having a child welfare guide that kind of aligns with the government information they're using. So uh, an example of a great general government information guide is from the University of Washington. I love this page. Uh, so it's government resources by subject. Uh, and this is one of those has everything where you can go to the guide and then you can browse by what you need. And it just has an amazing amount of information on it. Um, it would take a very long time. This is that maintenance workload um, in order to like build and then you know have maintain this, this type of guide. And then you have smaller topical guides, like Rutgers' um, Social Welfare Policy Guide. Uh, so I really like this one because you'll see it breaks down different types of government information, uh, but it doesn't, uh, it just feels like it's still embedded within uh, the, their information literacy needs because it's not all government information. It still has your journal articles and, and other um, tips and advice on on uh, writing. Excuse me. Uh, and you'll see within this guide just government information everywhere, <laughs> and it's sort of peppered within. So uh, this is a really good example uh, of a guide. So I have six website recommendations that I would definitely include on an online research guide, especially for social workers. Uh, there are more. There are definitely other websites you could include. You can check out both of the two examples of loop guides that I already showed you, and, and they're prime for all these major uh, resources. So my first one to include would be Medline Plus. Now, this while I think that the next four, the first four are probably um, resources you've heard of as a government information librarian and or else used previously. Why I really like Medline Plus, it's easy to read materials. So this is where you can kind of hook your undergraduates and have them understand what it's like to step through a website like this. You go to Medline Plus, you'll see the health topics or drugs and supplements. You can click on the health topics. They can browse by health topic. Or more importantly, they can look at by demographic group. So a lot of times, they'll have a health topic, but then they also need a demographic group that coincides with that. So instead of looking at um, like cancer in general, it's cancer in children or cancer in seniors. It's, it's narrowing that idea in. Uh, here. Uh, you can select your demographic group, and then you can choose a health topic within it. So my example in the middle box is children and mental health. So when you go to the children and mental health page, you'll see a summary about the topic, and then you'll see the start here, which this is very useful because it gives the students not only government information, but then organizations and other reliable uh, resources they can use to understand that topic. Next, PubMed. Now, I know you probably know a lot about PubMed already, <laughs> um, but it does have uh, so many citations, and it really does feature on biomedical literature, life sciences, and even have online books. So many of it is full text, um, and then some are just uh, annot um, index and abstracts. Uh, this is run by the National Center of Biotechnology Information from within the National Library of Medicine. So a lot of times in my social science classes, I might say, this stuff sounds very sciencey, <laughs> or uh, and it, that's because it's coming from a medical journal or anything else. So sometimes it's definitely uh, harder to understand things in PubMed since it is more academic than Medline Plus. 
they do have online trainings available, uh, so you can click on the documentation and kind of go through some of the trainings of PubMed. And this, is, this box is an example of search for child welfare, and then at the top you see this that says best matches for it, so you can switch your results for this best matches, which is an interesting uh, way to filter and sort. Congress.gov is the next website I would definitely include in, in my LibGuides. Um, it is the official website of U.S. Federal Legislative Information. Um, you can search for current and previous uh, laws. There are coverage dates available on um, Congress.gov that tells you uh, how far back maybe the bills might go versus laws and, and, and so forth. Uh, one thing I really like about Congress.gov is you can browse by policy area and legislative subject terms. So each item will get say this shows the 115th Congress, each piece of legislation will have one uh, legislative subject term, something that a bigger area that it falls within. However, it can have multiple policy areas. So you can browse by either one, whichever one is, is more appropriate for you. Also on Congress.gov, one thing that I get a lot from social work students are um, they're trying to find legislation that actually went through, stuff that actually became a law. Um, sometimes they get drowned in uh, all the results. So in this results uh, snapshot we see that we were looking for Helping Homeless Veterans Act, uh, Veterans Act. And as you see here, look at over 700 were introduced. So it is hard for students to sometimes understand and sort through that information. Um, and narrowing it by status of legislation helps, helps them find exactly what they're looking for. USA.gov. So USA.gov I use all the time um, for every topic. And I usually tell my students that it is a thing that like the Google for the government, except the search isn't as fabulous as Google's search for them. Uh, so it is your online guide for government information and services. What's on it, what's within the results, you'll see um, stuff from federally um, available, publicly available websites, so the big government-owned ones that you expect to see. But you'll also see these quasi-government agencies um, and things on the state and local government level. So you'll see stuff like Maryland.gov, right? Um, and then sponsored websites, so USPS for the Postal Service. Uh, occasionally you'll see those .coms, .orgs, .nets. And then finally, very infrequently, they will have websites that are not government owned. Um, if it has information that's relevant, that is not officially available in uh, a government website. So occasionally you'll see that. So as we're going through the results for this homeless uh, veteran search, uh, you could see that these are all from the VA, the top results, and then benefits at the VA. Uh, I always have, uh, I always point that out to my social work students of, is it actually a doc of there? Where is it coming from? Is it uh, from Virginia, or is it actually, you know, uh, uh, from like a federal agency? The next two resources you might not know about, but I think are important for social work, uh, the AHQ, AHRQ, Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, has an evidence-based practice center. Uh, this is pretty awesome. I like it a lot. You can go here and you can search within for your topic and then kind of refine and narrow a little bit and then get whatever care program that you, that you see. So if I put in stress here, I can go through the results and see, oh, well, here are these meditation programs for psychological stress and well-being. Uh, the student assignments tend to be very focused on, here's my problem, here's my population, what interventions, what services, what programs are out there. So using uh, something like this, I can put in stress, I can put in homelessness, whatever it is I'm looking for, and then see how, um, what reports and programs are out there on that. Uh, SAMHSA, now I hope I'm saying that right too, it's the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. Uh, they have a website about their programs. Uh, they have um, a whole bunch of different topics. Please go there, explore. You can search in the search box for a keyword if you're not sure which program um, is appropriate for you. 
the program that I want to feature today is their Evidence-Based Practices Resource Center. Uh, so this incorporates what we talked about earlier of finding that evidence um, in order to inform the interventions as a social worker. So here you go to this page. You can narrow by topic. Look, you have your topical area, what the students are looking for, your population or demographic, um, and then hit apply. And you'll see uh, different results uh, to help support both the practitioner and the client. You can click on that, and then you can see the page, so you can get that PDF. Or you, as a social worker, you can order free copies. I believe they're up to 30 copies. But the details will be on that website. So if you meet a client in person and they want that pamphlet, then you can order them ahead of time. So some final thoughts um, that I wanted to share. Uh, reach out to people. I know we talked about communicate a few times um, in the strategies. You want to find that local buy-in. It's there somewhere. It just might not be in the first few places you look. Uh, look for community partners, so people on campus and then people off campus who uh, could help connect government information literacy um, for the benefit of your social work students. Contact other librarians at different institutions. You know, we love to talk about our work and what we've done for things. So reach out to us, um, and we'll share our experiences. Uh, also, experiment uh, to see what works for you. Not every idea or thing is going to work for each institution. Libraries and universities are different. They have different cultures. They have different way of doing things. So test out new ideas, um, whether it's communicating with your faculty and getting that buy-in, or you're developing resources for your library instruction. And don't let that failure deter you. If something doesn't work, that's OK. Um, try, you can try something different next semester. You can tweak it, or you can you know, just start afresh. I think just the idea of trying to move forward and develop things um, uh, is helpful. So I have my references here. I have more references I'm going to add to this. And I can give you a handout of all my links. Um, so that can be posted when the video gets archived on, on the website. So I just want to say thank you for attending. Um, if you have any questions or comments, or if you'd like to share your experiences, I would love to hear it. Also, I'm always looking for partners. If you're interested in doing research on government information and social work, uh, reach out to me. Please let me know. So a student asked you about time logs and child welfare workers. Where can I find such information? What time logs? Uh, I don't know offhand, um, but I'm thinking that uh, some of our resources that we reviewed, um, in the beginning we talked about um, learning about social work. I'm not sure if they would go that far in advance. But I think the National Association of Social Workers could have something. So this will talk a bit about the profession. And they'll also have publications um, and other things like a social work blog. So I would try looking um, at um, the National Association of Social Workers and see what they have here. They do have a practice, practice se section um, for child welfare. So I can click on child welfare and scroll down and look at the tools that they have. Uh, and this is probably a research, resource I'd explore. Um, oops, nothing about time logs there. Uh, the alternative would be talking to a social work faculty member and seeing what they would recommend. Uh, I do have um, my library science degree. Um, I might eventually. Um, seek uh, a master's in social work, um, but I don't currently have it. So I don't have that knowledge uh, within uh, the field itself. I would, I would say check with one of your faculty members and see what they recommend, um, or else see if there's a local agency um, that you can reach out to. Reach out to their maybe trainer and see what they say, because usually the trainer would um, be able to answer uh, and train within that topic. Thank you very much, Michelle. This is great. 
Um, thank you, everybody, for coming today.